And then in the book of Romans chapter 1 and verse 11, the apostle Paul wrote this. Romans 1, 11, he said, For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end ye may be established. Everyone say the word impart. I want to just preface my remarks here tonight by saying God has been extremely good to me. I have gotten to do what most people only read about in books. I've told young people everywhere, if you will give everything you are to Jesus, give him everything you are, you will get to do things other people only read about in books. He'll take you places you never dreamed you would go. Your eyes will behold things that others do not see. Your ears, your heart will understand what others do not understand. People, uh, they're very kind to me. People say wonderful things to me. They give me some sometimes outstanding introductions. I've asked most pastors, preachers, just say something simple. And here's the reason, because I'm really no one special. I really am not. I'm glad that people think I am, but I'm really no one special. Not really. I am, though, a real Bible believer. I'm a real Bible believer. I'm a believer. I am a believer. And that sets me apart from some people. So tonight, I have decided as of late to tell some things about myself I've never told until now. I want to entitle this, How Did I Get Where I Am in God? How did I get where I am? I want you to lift your hands, your voices, and your hearts and pray that God will give you a revelation understanding that will absolutely put boldness in you like you've never had before. And don't worry about your neighbor behind, beside, before you, but just in your way of doing things, get hold of God for just a moment. Just cry out to God with your voice. Lord Jesus, tonight, by the authority of the Word of God, by the power of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, hear and answer by fire in this place. Let there be revelation here. Let there be understanding in this place. Help us to feel the brush of angels' wings. Help us to feel the vibration of the sandal-footed man from Galilee walking through the corridors of our hearts. Hear us, O oh Master of the universe, when we lift our voices to you, when we lift our hands to you, when we cry out to you, we will not fail to give you praise, glory, and honor. We ask these things in the matchless resplendent, O oh, powerful name of the Lord Jesus Christ, for his glory, for the furtherance of his kingdom. Blessed be the name of Jesus. You may go down clapping. <clears throat> Just once again, clap with all of your might. Just once again. You can do better than that. Every man, every woman, every young person, clap your hands and let your voice out because he is worthy of our praise. He is worthy of our praise here tonight. And God is in this place. And I'm here to tell you that where Jesus is, anything can happen. Anything can happen. Anything is possible. I don't care what the doctor told you. I don't care what the prognosis is or the diagnosis. He made a body out of clay and he can heal it. You can be healed right there where you're seated, right there where you're standing. If you believe that, just shout with your voice for a moment to the Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. God bless you. You may be seated. I have worked since I was 12 years old doing one thing or another. So I know what it's like to work. 
my father drank. He was not a habitual drunkard, but he did drink. And it made things difficult for my sister and I. And during those years of growing up, my mother became very ill. We thought we might lose her. I had only one pair of Levi's when I went to high school. And I would come home from school at night and I'd wash them so I had the same pants to wear the next day. And I worked during gardening. I detasseled corn in Iowa in the summer times. I did all kinds of things. Land, I did mowing lawn and whatever. When I was 16 years old, I was doing some yard work. I did it on a regular basis for this man and his wife. And I worked until noon. And um, he was off at work, but she took me in the car um, to the farmhouse where we lived in a small rural village called Monroe, Iowa. And so she came to the intersection. They lived at the outskirts of this little village. And so she took me in the car to this one intersection that we'd cross and go on to the area where I lived. But um, when she stopped at the intersection and looked both ways and then pulled out into the intersection, we didn't see, she didn't see, there was a farmer who had come home from the field for lunch and his wife said, the baby was screaming and crying. She said, we don't have any milk, we're out of milk. You've got to race to town and get some milk and bring it back. So he got in his car and he raced into that little village and got some milk and he was coming back to his house and he was going 65 miles an hour in that residential area at the edge of the village and he didn't stop for the stop sign. He came straight through that stop sign. And when he did, he hit on my side of the car in the door and just caved the door in. And it was an old Edsel. They were very heavy automobiles, if you remember them. It just caved that door in and I was knocked unconscious. I don't know to this day. I never did find out how I got out of the car. I don't know. But when I finally, when my head began to clear, I was stumbling around in the street, and by that time cars had come and there were people, and uh, somehow they got me to the farmhouse where I lived with my parents and my sister. But it was a terrible situation because I grew up in a farm community, milk cows, slop pigs, did garden work, all of that, I've done it. And um, so I was strong. I just was a healthy individual. But that car hit so hard that what happened was it forced my spinal column out of alignment from the base of my skull to the tailbone a whole inch to the left. I, I can't tell you the complications that arose in my health and my body. I, I can't tell you how bad it was. I just was in terrible shape. But <clears throat> I'm a fighter, and I have a lot of energy, and I have a lot of determination. So during that same time, in that small village called Monroe, Iowa, each year they had an old settlers program. And it was an outdoor um, platform built, and they had a, you know, Local talent came and played guitars and banjos, and they sang and various things like that. And it was a big thing for that small village. And so every year, they had this Old Settlers program. Well, I went. We always went. And I went. And uh, something had happened, though, in the, uh, from last year to this year. There was a teacher who came to that area, and she opened a tap dance school. She had a number of students. So she was invited to bring those students to this program and present the students tap dancing. And I was there to watch it. It was amazing. It really was. I'd never seen anything quite like it. And I thought to myself, I'd like to do that. And I'm the kind of person if I'm interested in it, I've always been a talented individual. I could always do exactly what I wanted to do. 
if, I don't, if I'm not interested, I couldn't care less. But if I'm interested, I'll go at it. Because I don't consider myself to be retarded. If someone else can do a lot of it, I should be able to do a little of it. And I'll go at it. So, at the end of that tap dance recital, I walked behind the stage and I walked up to the teacher and she was an incredible dancer, she really was. She gave a performance at the end of that recital with her students. So I walked up to her and I said to her, I said, look, I don't have the money to pay for these lessons. I said, but I have won three gold medals. I've been a march, I've been a drum major in marching band, and I was for several years in high school. I said, I've won three gold medals in baton twirling at national events. And I said, I will teach you what I know about this if you will give me lessons. She said, mm, it's a deal. You only get what you negotiate for, ladies and gentlemen. I negotiated. I started taking lessons. And people, whatever I'm into, I'm into it. If you eat out with me in a restaurant, I'm into it. <laughs> you may talk to yourself, but I'm into eating. <laughs> if I'm into Jesus, I'm into him. If I'm into dancing, I'm going to be into him. Get into him. Whatever you're into, get into it. Get into it. Just get into it with everything that you are. So I started dancing. And it wasn't very long until I was really accomplishing some things. And the basic step is like that. I can still do it. So, so I got into it. Well, I began to dance some with her. She was a tremendous dancer. He became friends with the whole family. At any rate, there was a talent show opened in Des Moines, Iowa, up in uh, that area at the, at the big theater. So I went to audition for this talent show, and I won. So then that led me to KRT Theater, where they had a big production. And what this person did was they took the various ones that had auditioned in this talent show and they used them as per particular performances throughout the production. I was a naval officer dressed in a white uniform. I had a f just three or four speaking lines, that was it. But the thing they wanted me to do was they wanted me at one point in this particular production to just do this tap dance recital that I had auditioned with in the contest, and so I did it. I can't do it now, but at that time, I could tap dance in small circles, and I would make a big circle like this. I did that in the middle of my routine all, around, all across that stage. I was going in small circles, tap dancing all the way around. Before I got to the end of that circle, I received nine rounds of applause. God, I, and here, here's what's crazy about it. I, I think it's crazy. I didn't have the Holy Ghost, wasn't baptized in Jesus' name, but every time I would get ready to go out for a performance, I'd step behind the curtain and say, God, help me, help me to do this. I don't know if he did or not, but I always won. I mean, it was just amazing. <laughs> This Jesus is something, people. He is merciful. Well, then that performance led me to the Community Playhouse in Des Moines, Iowa, where they had this big production going, Finian's Rainbow. It was a longtime hit on Broadway, simply the story of idle sharecroppers, sharecroppers in the South who had struck a pot of gold, and they became just idle sharecroppers after that. It was, it, was a, it was a great musical. The music was tremendous. Anyway, I went to audition for that because they needed two male lead dancers in that production. Well, it was modern jazz. It wasn't really tap dancing. And, and I, I, can, I can do that, too. It was this type of thing, you know? And so I went 
and auditioned. Well, and, I, and they asked me. They wanted me to do it, so I won. And the other guy was there, too. But the, we auditioned. I went to rehearsal after rehearsal. Uh, there were cast parties. There were all kinds of things. I went through all of that. But then there was the, the first night of the production, which was press night. It was open to the press. So we gave the complete performance, as if there had been 10,000 people there, for the press, photographers, newspaper reporters, cameras, all this type of thing. Well, at the end of it, uh, they were applauding. The place was filled with reporters from the local newspapers, whatever. But at the end of it, they asked those people who had lead parts, and I had one of the lead male dance parts in that production. So they wanted the lead people to step down front, and the reporters would come and greet us. So that's what we did. I was in that line down front, and I was shaking hands, and they were taking photographs and all kinds of things. But this one reporter walked up to me, and he said, young man, I don't know who you are. He said, but someday we will see your name in lights. Well, you know what that would do to a 19-year-old kid. It did it to me. I was excited. So every time I go to a new meeting, camp meetings, church activities, whatever, I notice on the lawn there'll be a big marquee in lights. It says, Lee Stone King, evangelist, come nightly, etc." He was right. My name is in lights, but it's a different dance. It's a different performance. It's a whole different world. And I'm so glad for to I'm so grateful to be a dancer for this Jesus. People, when you come to church, you ought to dance and shout and worship God because He is worthy of your praise. You can at least tap a foot. You ought to get involved. Look at the effort you made to get here tonight. Don't sit there like a frog caught in a snowstorm. You ought to tap your foot. You ought to clap your hands. You ought to get your hands in the air. You ought to worship God because I reiterate, I repeat it, He is worthy of our praise. You're never going to clap enough. You're never going to shout enough. We're never going to dance enough to thank Him for even one drop of blood. So tonight, he deserves a standing, uproaring ovation. Jesus, we worship you because you are God. Blessed be the name of Jesus forever. But the time, by the time I was 19 years old, I had 36 and a half hours credit towards a master's degree in dancing. I belonged to the Chicago Royal Association of Dance Masters. Doreen Tempest, when the Royal Ballet in England was there, Fred Astaire belonged to that. Ray Bolger belonged to that. I was into it. Mm. People don't fool me. You are what you are because you want to be that way. I've passed it three times. I've seen it all. People are what they are because they want to be that way. I don't care where you came from, who your parents were. You don't have to come from some long lineage of great preachers. That's nonsense. When you got baptism of the Holy Ghost, when you were down in water in Jesus' name, you got the credential. You got the master's degree. You got the doctorate. You've got the power. These signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They, believers, shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. They shall recover. They shall recover. It is written. It is written. And there's nothing the devil can do about it. There's nothing anyone can do about it. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you understand what I'm saying, give some evidence of what you understand because it ought to put a dance in your feet. It ought to put a clap in your hands. It ought to put a shout in your voice. It ought to put a run in your legs. One more time, clap with all of your might and just let your voice out.
from there, I was on my way to Radio City Music Hall in New York City to audition. And I felt, I felt like I would have made it. But my back got so much worse. I, it just got so much worse. I, I would come home from school or whatever and just practically go to bed. I was, I was in bad shape. And I was going to the doctor at this time. I kept going like that till I got into the business world. And I worked for Rock Island Motor Transit Company in the office. And it got so bad that I was going to the doctor Monday night after work, Wednesday night after work, Friday night after work. And sometimes I couldn't get from Friday night to Monday without help. And the doctor came in. He would help me on weekends. I was just going down. And I, there was nothing that I could do. And about <coughs> that same time, when I was about, it was about 19 or 20, 19 actually, my grandmother Stone King passed away. They had come from the East Coast by covered wagon to Iowa, and they had, my grandfather Stone King had settled a thousand acres there. And that, those days, whatever you settled, it belonged to you, it was given to you by the state, the government, whatever. So today, it's a thousand acre game reserve. But at one time, my grandfather Stone King owned that. Well, and the Stone King Cemetery is still there. My grandmother had stories to tell. Like you couldn't believe how there were panthers at night and they couldn't leave a baby in a crib out in the yard because the eagles would come and catch the baby and carry it away to a nest and they have to get the farmers together to climb the hills and find the nest and they'd find the baby's clothes. Well, I want to tell you something. As a child, you sit down at someone's feet and hear those kind of stories. You need help to get to bed in the dark because you don't want to go to bed in the dark. So I remember all of that. And she, when she sat down on, a, on the rocking chair, we had a rocking chair for her. She spent two or three months every year with, it, with us on the farm. But when she took that hair down, that bun on the back, it would lay on the floor. She had never cut her hair in her entire life. In her entire life. And she was 90-some when she passed away. But she became ill and she passed away. And it was a terrible shock to me because we had never lost anyone that was really close to us. So I went, we went to the funeral home for the viewing, the wake, whatever you call it in this part of the country. We went for that first night. And um, <clears throat> it was really something. I knew, because there's a Stone King tradition I knew that the night before the burial, they would bring the body to the house and the family would sit up all night with the body and then it was buried the next day. That was the tradition. I knew they would do that. So at the viewing, it ha so happened that the family was large and the, the, there was no one had a home that could house the body and the crowd that would come. So they had to go to this funeral home and that's where we went for the viewing. So I, when I walked in, I, I walked up to the casket, and um, it was such a wall. And I reached in with this hand and took a hold of her folded hands, and they were so cold. I stood there. There was no communication. There was nothing. It was a wall. I walked out of that funeral home and I walked around that block. I don't know how many times I walked around it. But I walked back in and went over and sat down beside my mother against the wall in that funeral home. I turned my head and looked at her and I said, Mom, I am going to find God. That's where it all began for me. Somewhere you've got to make up your mind. I am going to find God. And that spirit is in this house here tonight. I know you know about him, but many of you, you need to make up your mind. I am going to find God. I am going to get into everything that he has to offer for me. Somewhere you've got to make up your mind. Somewhere you've got to get into that. 
So I started my journey to find God. I went to the Evangelical Free Church. I, I got involved with Campus Crusade. I was in Youth for Christ. I was a counselor. I took youth groups to Billy Graham Crusades. The Evangelical Free Church, where I, be, where I went to, when I was trying to find God, I started out there. I'd been a Baptist as a little boy, but I went to this Evangelical Free Church. I want to tell you something, folks. On Sunday night at the Evangelical Free Church at that time, the service started exactly at 7 o'clock and ended exactly at 8 o'clock. Here, you never know when you're going to get out of here. It just goes on and on and on and on. <clears throat> Someone, when I was 23 years of age, I, I struggled. I kept reaching from the time I was 19 until I was 23. Someone invited me to an apostolic Christian church service. <laughs> it was not a beautiful church like I went to, stained glass windows, a robe choir, and all the rest. It was a basement in a parsonage because it was a home missionary setting, and they were going to build a new church because the throughway had taken the old building. So, it's a long story, but I had a cousin who had visited me, him and his wife, and they saw that I was involved with Jesus, and they were apostolic Christians, and they called the local UPC pastor and said, we've got a cousin there. We believe he is hungry for God. Go after him. And so this, this man called me, Reverend Butcher, whoever he is, he called me and said, we want to invite you to our services. I still can't explain it. I can now, but I couldn't then. I felt something in his voice. I mean, I could feel something, and it unnerved me. So my answer was, he said, we'll come and get you. I didn't have a car. I was going to Drake University at that time. I was studying commercial art at that time. And so he said, we'll come and get you. And my answer was, no, I'll call you if I, I need you to come. I'll call you. Don't you call me. I'll call you. So I was in misery. Just I felt like I should go. So eventually, after a few weeks of just suffering, what I now find out is conviction, I, I, I called and said, I, I'm going to come. So they were delighted. If you're a visitor here tonight, let me warn you. Apostolics will do anything to get you. They'll come and drive you. They'll take you out for dinner. They'll invite you to their home. They'll do it. They will do it. And if you are a visitor here tonight, the safest you are among us. If we lift our hands, you need to lift your hands. If we stand, you ought to stand. If we sing, you need to sing. Because if you don't, we know you're a visitor. And we'll go after you. You need to act like us. Just act like us. It's not going to hurt you. Just act like us. They all act crazy at ball games. What are you going to do in here? Let's just act like this for Jesus. Let's just give him our voice. Let's just shout. We make no apology for this. God has done a miracle for us. We have found him. We have found him. And he is alive. Clap again and let your voice out. Because there is a spirit of rejoicing in this place. Mm. You may be seated. So Brother Butcher came and got me. And the entrance to this basement was outside the house, in the basement of his house. Well, I was used to going to a big, magnificent church, and now I'm going into this basement. And, and so we went down in there. People, uh, there were cobwebs hanging from the ceiling. Uh, the carpet was worn out. The altar rail shook, I found out when I finally got there. I mean, uh, it was just different. And they played all these instruments. I mean, and they, they started, when that song service began, they took off 95 miles an hour. I mean, they took off. And I'm thinking, how did I ever get talked into coming here? And I'm not kidding you. I said to myself, if I ever get out of here alive, I will never be back. Don't ever say never. Just don't ever say never. It's not the thing to do. It's not the thing to do. 
I mean, they were worshiping. Ooh. They were raising their hands and shouting and all of these things. In the Evangelical Free Church, if you sneezed, it would have an effect on the service. And if you had a coughing spell, it would probably shut it down. But here, you could fall dead and nobody would even know you were dead. They would just think you were slain in the spirit. <laughs> Clap your hands again. Just let your voice out and worship God. Ah! But in that service, I saw something I had not seen in the Baptist church as a child, in the Evangelical Free Church in my late teens and early 20s. I'd not seen it in Billy Graham Crusades. I'd not seen it anywhere. During the course of that service, they had prayer requests. And um, there were people who raised their hands and said, Brother Butcher, I want prayer for my body tonight. I had never seen that anywhere. And then I watched. The butcher would stop everything and call them to come forward. And they would go forward and he would anoint them with oil. And I could hear his voice. It wasn't a large congregation. He'd pray in Jesus' name. And those people were respectable people. They were dressed nicely. They'd go back to their seats. And then you have what, what you call a testimony service. Later in the service... Some of those same people who'd been down there for healing would stand with tears running down their cheeks with their hands raised and say, I want to thank God for healing my body tonight. The pain is gone. I had never seen that before. And I was desperate. I was desperate. And when a person is desperate, you don't care what has to be done as long as it works. You're just desperate. You don't care what it looks like. I'm telling you tonight, those people out there in this world are desperate. They don't care what you look like. They don't care how you act. They just want to know if you've got what you say you've got. And if you've got it, they want it. <laughs> so I thought to myself, I wonder if that would work for me because I was desperate going to all these, these situations and sessions with this doctor and treatments and whatever. I was desperate. So the next time I went to one of their services, which was three or four weeks later, I met Brother Butcher outside the building and I said, Pastor Butcher, I want healing for my body. I want prayer for my body tonight. I want healing for my body. That's what you had said. So I knew if, if I said what you had said, he'd know what I needed. I want prayer for my body. He said, will you come and we'll pray for you tonight? Well, the service started and folks, they took off 110 miles an hour tonight. I mean, they were into it. And I thought he had forgotten me. I honestly did. I was just a young kid type thing. So I did something that's totally out of character for me. I don't do things like this. But I raised my hand in the middle of all of that. That's out of character for me. I don't do things like that normally. I do a lot of things now I didn't do then. Okay, we'll leave it that way. But I raised my hand. Well, he stopped everything. He said, Mr. Stone King, I said, I want prayer for my body. He said, you come right now. Well, now my heart began to beat because I had seen what happened to you when he prayed for you. I didn't know what was going to happen to me. I didn't know what would happen when you laid hands on me. I didn't know what was going to take place. Hmm. But I walked down there, and um, I knew what he was going to do because I'd watched him do it to you. He was going to take that little bit of that oil and brush my forehead and say in Jesus' name. That's what I knew. Well, <clears throat> when he did that, I raised both hands this high. That was major for me. This came months later, but this was major right here. I lifted my hands this high, and when he said, I command in Jesus' name for you to be healed, all I said was, I believe. But that's all you have to say. That's all you have to say. I believe. If you know that's true, clap, worship, because people have been healed here miraculously of many things. Jesus, I worship you. I worship you. Mm. That was on a Sunday night. It was on Sunday night. I went home. 
Monday morning, there was no pain. There was no pain. Tuesday morning came, and there was still no pain. I mean, my shoulders, my back, there was no pain, none at all. Wednesday came, and there was still no pain. Thursday came, and I felt like I had a new lease on life. I had suffered with this for years. Friday came, and the doctor's office called. And they said, you've missed all your appointments this week. I said, yes, I know that. They said, are you bedfast? I said, no. Well, what happened to you? I said, I don't think you're going to believe this, but I've been to a small apostolic Christian church on the east side of Des Moines, Iowa. They believe in divine healing. They anointed me with oil, and I've been healed. I'll never forget it. He said, I want to see you. They always want to see you. So I went to his office, and I gave him the, all the details. I told him everything about this healing. He was furious. He pointed a finger at me, and he said, I'll give you one month, boy, and you'll be back to me in worse shape than you've ever been in. And I just grinned. I said, no, I don't think so. I think this is going to work. It's 52 years later, and it's still working. In Jesus' name. It was at that point I said to myself, if there is a Jesus this real, I will shout this from the housetops. And I have done so for 52 years. And as long as I have strength, I'll keep shouting it. Because Jesus is real. He is alive. He is a healer. He is a deliverer. Nothing, nothing shall be impossible to them that believe. So... I was shy in those days. That's why I only did this. I, in high school, I lied myself out of every speech class I was in, scared to death of speaking publicly. Dancing, no problem. Speaking, that was another world. But when I got the Holy Ghost, I couldn't lie anymore. So I had to do something. And I learned how to stand and testify in your church services. That's where I first started preaching was in just those testimonies. Oh, but because I had prayed so hard to get the Holy Ghost, because I was real shy, you know, they would get a hold of me in the altar, and it was a basement, hot in the summertime, no air conditioning, and I had been voted the best dressed man in the Evangelical Free Church, so I had some nice threads, as you say, and I would wear those nice threads to those services. I mean, end of an altar service, I looked like I'd crawled out of a garbage pail, and everything went to the cleaners the next day. That's how it was. But I was afraid not to wear the best I had. I didn't want to offend Jesus, so I would wear the best I had, and I'd go to these services. And it was amazing, just amazing, because I'd get out of that altar, and I would be shy, and, and I'd, you know, pray, and well, all of that type of thing, and they'd get a hold of me. <coughs> It was amazing, and they would pray, and they would take my tie off. They'd loose my, loosen my tie for me in the altar service, and then they would rub my shoulders. I can't find one scripture about that in the, in the New Testament. There's not, nothing in there, nothing. And then they'd peel my coat off, you know, that type of thing. And there was a friend of mine, we, we all, three of us came in at the same time, and the church was old, and the pulpit was old, and they had varnish on it, and he prayed so hard that summer, that night in that place, that he melted the varnish on that pulpit, and when he got ready to stop praying, he couldn't get loose in the pulpit. We had to come out of the chair, out of the suit, and we had to peel the coat off later. But that's the type of thing we were in. And what was interesting is these people would give me all kinds of advice. They would say to me, oh, 
Hold on. Anybody relate to that? Let go. How does one hold on and let go at the same time? I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to do it. And then they'd say, yield. Yield to what? I don't know what you're talking about. And the night I got the Holy Ghost, I, English has, I majored in English in college and in high school, whatever. So English is, is not difficult for me. Enunciation, pronunciation, all that type of thing. So I'm always very clear about things like that. So I'd get to praying for the Holy Ghost, and this little tug would come to my tongue, and what I was saying would begin to slur. And that sounded strange to me, like I was out of control. You have to be out of control. But nobody told me. To be, I didn't know. So I would stop, lick my lips and swallow, and I just swallowed the Holy Ghost. He was right there. I was very near to receiving the Holy Ghost. One night, I got so stupid tired, I didn't care what it sounded like. In fact, I was down like this praying because, as I said, I was shy. And the Holy Ghost said to me, you could raise, you could raise yours a little higher to me. And, and, you know, in my way of thinking, I said, no, this, this is all right, Jesus. I'm, I'm comfortable. I'm comfortable right here. <laughs> but then the anointing lifted. So I, I raised my hands like this, and I could feel more of God. And, and but I was all settled in that. And then the Holy Ghost said, you could reach higher. And I said, Jesus, this is fine. I'm, I'm okay right here. I'm okay right here. But he, he lifted, so I, I stood to my feet. I, I mean, and then I, and the Holy Ghost came on me more powerfully. It was amazing. And then I had my hands up like this, and he said, you could reach higher to me. And I didn't know what to do, so I went up like this. But you can only stay that, stay there just so long. And I, I couldn't. I had to let my heels down. And I, I, I just cried out. I said, Jesus... I have reached to you as high as I can reach. You've got to come down to me. I can't reach any higher. At that moment, the Holy Ghost fell on me. I burst out speaking with tongues. I spoke with tongues for over an hour and a half. Different dialects, different languages. It was absolutely incredible. It just poured out of me. As he said here tonight, a fountain of living waters. It just poured out of me, out of me. So I finally, that night I had one snow, I had worn snow white pants, a dark brown sport jacket, and I was lying on my, on that raw cement floor in between the pews, speaking with tongues. When I finally stopped, I opened my eyes and looked up, Brother Butcher was leaning over that pew in front of me, looking down at me, and I said, Brother Butcher, I've got it. He said, I'm afraid you do, boy. He said, you've really got it. So I was so excited they had me over to the parsonage afterwards, upstairs, uh, to have something to eat, which is our tradition. And uh, they asked me to say grace, and I started speaking with tongues. I went home, knelt down beside my bed about 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning to thank God for the Holy Ghost, began to speak with tongues. So the next morning, when the alarm went off, I didn't get up. I called the office at 8 o'clock, and I said, I am not coming to work today. They said, are you sick? I said, no. They said, what's wrong? I said, you would never, ever understand. I said, but I'll be there tomorrow. I had prayed so hard to get the Holy Ghost that when I finally got it, I declared a national holiday for myself, and I stayed home from work, and I practiced the Holy Ghost all day long. I listened to those LPs by Sister Mangan, Merle Ewing, all of that. I just spoke with tongues all day long. I declared a national holiday for myself. And I got paid for it. <laughs> Does anybody feel like celebrating here tonight? There's a celebratory spirit in this place tonight. <clears throat> and this is where I really want to go. Someone asked me, a preacher last year, he, we had a tremendous altar service. There were miracles of healing, various things that happened. He walked up near the end of the altar service, and he said, Brother Stone King, when did you get a hold of all of this? When did all this begin to happen for you? When did all these healings start? I said, what do you mean? He said, when did God begin to use you like this? I looked at him and said, 
I've always had it. Because I am a believer. In fact, that Monday morning, I was buying a home in Highland Park, Des Moines, Iowa, and right around the corner was the landlord and his wife that were selling me this small home. <clears throat> and we were friends, went out to eat, members of Evangelical Free Church, all of that. And you know how you are when you first get the Holy Ghost, you're just so excited? You don't care what anybody thinks, you just say it, you just tell it. You're swinging from the rafters, the chandeliers, and you don't care what anybody thinks. But then after you're here for six months or a year, you become what we call mature. No, 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 you're backslid. People, don't ever let go of that initial touch of God in your life. Don't ever let anybody take that from you. No devil in hell, no human spirit. Because he is worth it. He is worthy. I praise him because he's alive. He is real. He is tangible. He can do anything, everything, all things. Again, I repeat, nothing shall be impossible to them that believe. This Jesus is the master of everything. He is the dear and glorious physician. He's a brother. He's a mother. He's a father. He's a sister. He is everything you're ever going to need in this life. If you do believe that, just clap for him in thanksgiving. In thanksgiving. Uh. <clears throat> so, the first thing I did Monday morning, I called the people, the landlord. And those days, nobody locked the houses. You didn't have to. Now you have to lock everything. But there you didn't lock anything. And so I said to her, I said, Ethel, I called her on the phone. And I said, I got the baptism of the Holy Ghost last night speaking with tongues. You know how you are. You just tell it. And um, she said, you got what? I said, I got the baptism of the Holy Ghost. She said, oh, she said, Lee, I am so sick. I can't get my head off the pillow. I have an excruciating headache. She was just really really up against it. And uh, I said, I'm coming over. So I ran over and went through the, the door. She was an older lady. And I knew where everything was in the house. I'd eaten there, stayed a lot of time there. And I went back to the bedroom. There she lay on that, with her white hair on that pillow. And she looked awful. I walked over to her and I said, Ethel. She said, I am so sick. She said, I can't get my head off the pillow. I said, Ethel, listen, I have become an apostolic Christian. You can lay hands on the sick. I can lay hands on the sick now and anoint with oil, and they'll be healed. Have you got any oil in the house? She said, I think there's some mazola oil in the kitchen. Well, he didn't say what kind of oil. It could be Penn State, Quaker State, whatever. It's not in the oil anyhow. It's in the name. It's in the name. So I ran to the kitchen. She said, I think there's some mazoil all in the kitchen. I ran to the kitchen and ransacked the cupboards, and I found this big bottle of mazoil oil. Well, I'm, it's my first debut, you know. It's my first anointing, and I'm nervous. I spilled the oil. Folks, I could have anointed the whole city. I had, I had oil all over my hands. I ran back there, laid my hands on her head, and said, I command this pain to be gone in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll never forget it. Took my hands off her head. She, her eyes opened wide. She grabbed her head and she said, It's gone. She said, It's gone. People, it is supposed to be gone. It is supposed to be gone. Something is supposed to happen when you lay hands on in the name of Jesus. Jesus, I praise you. So what I'm saying is this. I've always had it. I was praying for the sick within eight hours after I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and they were being healed miraculously. People, I knew that.
understand. I had a hold of something. Something had a hold of me that transcends human logic and reason and understanding. There is something miraculous in all of this. There is something miraculous. He has healed me. He has healed you. He is a healer. I say again tonight, I don't care what the doctor told you. I don't care what the prognosis is. I don't care what the diagnosis is. He is the dear and glorious physician. He made a body out of clay. One simple touch, he can burn. The rays of the Holy Ghost can burn out every cancer cell in your body. And I've seen it happen over and over again in the last few years. I, I prayed for, right after that. I prayed for my mother's pastor's wife. She was on her way to New York City from Iowa for some major back surgery. I went to the service one night, and she was in pain, came up for prayer. I got a hold of her, and I began to pray in Jesus' name. I'm a brand-new convert, people, but I wouldn't let go. I don't know that we should just do this and push them on. I think we ought to get a hold of people and hold on until we feel what we know, until we can feel that virtue go from us. And I held on and held on. God healed her standing right there in that altar service, healed her. Sister Doug Davis, now senior in New York, Long Island, she had a heart condition. I went down there. She was on her way to all kinds of surgery. She was playing the organ. And I walked over there in, a, in an altar service that had begun after I had preached, and I got a hold of this left hand of hers, and she was just running everything with this right hand, but I wouldn't let go. I would not let go. I kept praying. I just kept praising God. I kept commanding in Jesus' name, and I finally pulled her off that organ bench. And when I did, she began to dance. She began to shout, and she was healed instantaneously. So you come too late to tell me it can happen. It can happen. It does happen. It is happening. There are people being healed in this audience right now. In fact, the Holy Ghost has just shown me that there are people who walked in this auditorium tonight that there's a disease lurking in your body that would not have come to surface for another six months or a year, but because you have come into his auditorium, you have come into his sanctuary, and you have worshipped him, that disease has left your body. It has left your body. You'll never come down with it. You'll never have it. God is a healer. He is a healer. The virtue is in this place. The gift of healing, the gift of faith is in this house. Rejoice with each other for just a moment. There are people being healed right now. You're being healed right now. The Holy Ghost is moving through here in a fantastic move of deliverance and healing. The miraculous. Oh. You may be seated. I went off to Bible school just immediately. I went to Bible school right after that. I went to Apostolic Bible Institute in St. Paul, Minnesota. God used me in that school. I, I prayed for people. They were healed. There was one, one girl in my class. Uh, we always had lunch, of course, at the school after the Sunday morning service and worship. And we were there, and uh, we stayed a little longer, myself and some of my friends. So we were there just eating whatever, and some of the girls had left, and there were five of them that got in a Volkswagen, and they were driving on the main artery there in St. Paul, Minnesota. There had been a terrible accident. It demolished the Volkswagen. Uh, one of the girls was killed. Uh, she was, they said she was dead. Another one was in terrible shape. Well, when I found out, I just, they came in and said, look, there's been an accident. These, these girls, and they gave the names. So I just got up, and, and I got in the car I had at that time, and um, I began to drive to the hospital, and there I met Brother S.G. Norris, and he, because he, he knew what I did, he understood what I was doing in the school, and so he said, Brother Strong King, come with me. We walked into this hospital room where this student was lying, this woman, 
And the, the impact was so great that the, the, her face had slid off the skull to this, this side. It was awful. There was blood coming out of the nose, out of the mouth, out of the ears, out through the teeth. You could see the blood. And we joined hands over her as she lay there in that condition in the hospital bed and prayed in the name of Jesus. And God healed her. God absolutely healed her. In fact, it's Brother McPhail's life wife in Visalia, California. I just preached for them. If you looked at Sister McPhail, you would never know that there was a point at which the whole face had slid off the skull because Jesus is a healer. People, he is a healer. He is a total healer. She was miraculously, miraculously healed. But in that, in that same situation, there was one girl. Her name was Linda McEwen. They said that she was dead, and so they had taken her to the emergency room. They would not let me into the emergency room, but I went where the emergency room was, and about maybe eight feet back from the door, I got down on my knees like this. I didn't ask if I could. I didn't get permission. Forget all of that. I got down on my face like this and began to pray and speak with tongues and worship God. Doctors and nurses were coming back and forth on either side of me, but nobody stopped me. I prayed until I felt what I know released from me. She was raised from the dead. She's alive today because this Jesus, this Jesus is alive. He can do anything. He can do everything. I want to tell you something. I feel in this district I feel in this district, Brother Hodges, this district is ready for what I'm talking about like never before. This thing is breaking out among you in this hour. You're never going to be the same. Never going to be the same again. I went to upstate New York right after Bible college, and I began to pastor. In pastoring, I won a whole family to the Lord, mother, father, all the sons. I won them all. And uh, one little boy, the one son was about nine years old. He was out on a country gravel road. And um, <clears throat> a, a truck, a pickup truck coming around the curb, high weeds and everything like they have there. And um, he, the driver hit this child going about 65 miles an hour on that bicycle and threw that kid in the air. I never did find out how far but he was just thrown through the air. Well, the mother called me late in the afternoon and she said, Brother Stone King, this and this is this has happened. She said, the brain is so swollen inside the skull that it'll take a month for the swelling to go down. Would you go to the hospital and pray for him? I said, of course I'll go. So I waited until later. I prayed at home, but then I went later. And what I did was a lot of examples. But in 2011, a general conference I think it was the general board, wanted me to preach on Saturday night, Night of Miracles. And I agreed to do it. I went and preached that particular night. At the end of that, there were over 200 miracles of healing. What they asked for was everyone that was healed to write out the testimony on paper and then give it on the platform. There were so many people standing in line, they couldn't get everything written. In the end result, I found out there were over 200 people that received miracles of healing. In fact, I was one of the last people to leave there. And, and I tell you, the platform was covered with hearing aids. People, their ears had been opened. They threw hearing aids all over that platform. There were crutches on that platform. There were all kinds of things. One of our preachers was in the audience. He had a cancer the size of a golf ball growing on his throat. And while the people watched, the gift of faith was there. That thing totally disappeared, and the skin just closed over. The saints saw that. People, when you begin to see things like that, you don't care what people say. You don't care what they think. You don't care what they do. You've got it, and you know you've got it. A man with a, an experience is never at the mercy of a man who has an argument. Never! I later got a call from one of our pastors in Louisville, Kentucky. He said, Brother Stone King, I couldn't reach you. He said, but when I found out that they were doing Night of Miracles, he said, I brought four crippled people from my church. He said, all four of them were healed. They were all totally healed. <clears throat> Steve Willoughby, Barb and Steve Willoughby, missionaries to Singapore, 
Steve was an apostle. Barb was a prophetess. They were powerful, powerful people. Steve was the brother that I always wanted. We were very close. They were guests in my home. I'd been guests in their homes. We did meetings together in Malaysia and all of that type of thing. Steve always wanted me to travel with him by train all over Europe and visit all of our missionaries and pray people through the Holy Ghost. He talked about that till his dying breath. I said, Steve, we'll do it. Whatever has to be done, we'll do it. Well, <clears throat> but before that... We were in a meeting, I think it was in 2004. It was the, it was the general conference. And um, I had done what I felt to do. They, in those days, remember they'd have these Holy Ghost rallies the last night of general conference, and there would be a thousand or more people get the Holy Ghost at the end of those services. They've stopped doing that, but we were in one of those sessions where we were praying people through the Holy Ghost. And that night, there was over a thousand people received the Holy Ghost. It wasn't just me and Steve praying. There were many people praying, but Steve and I were to, the last two to leave the auditorium. So as we walked out of the auditorium in the lobby of that great uh, auditorium, convention center, just a crowd of our people. Well, Steve was right in front of me, and I was behind him, and as I was walking along, People would grab me and say, Brother Stone King, you prayed for me when I was this old and I was healed. One girl said to me, I was dying as a baby. My mother brought me to a service where you were. You prayed for me and I'm alive today. And she was a beautiful young teenage girl. She said, I just want to thank you. And I would keep going like that. And th this one would pull at me. That one would pull at me. And it was difficult to get through. But I give myself to the people and I would stop and say a prayer with them. Or I would shake their hand or hug their neck or whatever. But eventually we got through all the crowd and we got outside and we got ahead of the crowd and Steve and I were walking alone. And he turned and looked at me. He had tears running down his face. He said, Brother Stone King, you have convinced me. You've made a believer out of me. I said, what? He said, one man can make a difference. <laughs> and what I'm saying is, if I can do it, you can do it. One man can make a difference. One woman can make a difference. And God is pulling at you tonight. God is pulling at every man, every woman in this audience to get involved with him like never before to reach the multitudes. That's exactly what's going on. If you believe that, you ought to throw your hands in the air and say, Jesus, I'll do it. The Holy Ghost is pulling at us in this hour, in this place, to do the things that we've never done before. People, if you want to see something you've never seen before, you're going to have to do something you've never done before. <clears throat> As most of you know, or have heard, I suppose, Twelve and a half years ago, I fell dead of a massive heart attack in Sydney, Australia. I was clinked to dead, 45 minutes, no heartbeat, no breath. There was no hope for me. I was just a corpse on a stretcher, DOA, dead on arrival at the hospital. But in the ambulance, after all medical science had done, Jesus stepped on board that ambulance. My heart began to beat on its own, and the breath came back. It startled the driver. It startled the paramedic. So, at the end of last year, I began to pray. I said, Jesus, 12 and a half years ago, when I fell dead in Australia, I was ready to go. But I'm still here. Why am I here? What is it you want me to do for you? And then I said, and 10 years later, I had to have open heart surgery because they put stents in as preventative medicine and scar tissue formed around them and it blocked all the arteries on my heart. So I had to have a five and a half hour five bypass surgery. I said, but Jesus, I was ready to go then, but I'm still here. And then something else happened. I had to have another procedure and I said, Jesus, I'm still here. Why am I here? And then I went through a couple of more things that happened and something more recently. I said, Jesus, I have been ready to go at every point. Why am I still here? What is it you want me to do for you? I prayed that way for several days. 
the last day I prayed it, the Holy Ghost came on me. And he said, you are still here because I want you to impart to this generation my power, what I've given you. My world came together at that point. I had an understanding. Something settled in me. And this is really where I want to go. In 2004, on a Friday night, Anthony Mangan preached a message on holiness, and it was tremendous. And I was sitting on the very front row on the corner of Barb and Steve Willoughby, and the pulpit was right here. All of a sudden, at the end of Anthony's preaching, he stepped down the, walked down those steps and motioned for me to come. I thought he wanted me to come up there and stand, and he wanted to use me as an example of what God had done for me to raise me up. That's what I thought. When I got there, he handed me the mic and said, tell it. <laughs> he said, tell it. I realized then he wanted me to finish the message for him is what I understood. He said, later he told me, he said, I was exhausted. I didn't have another word to say, Brother Strong. He, I couldn't go on. So I took the mic and I walked up on that platform and probably seven or eight minutes, I began to tell about the miraculous power that God had used to, to heal me and raise me from the dead, whatever. It was amazing. The power of God fell in that place. I mean, it absolutely exploded. What happened was the, it was such a move of God, the people in the audience came up out of the audience and they covered that whole platform. They, they were saints everywhere. They were all over the platform. So I'm lost in the crowd on the platform. And I'm just ministering among and reaching out and praying for this one or that one. And the Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, I want you to transmit the gift of faith to this audience. Well, I know how to do that. I did it here last night. But there were four big sections of risers in the back of that auditorium. I was not on the mic. I'm lost in the crowd. They couldn't see me. But I walked over to that one section of pews, and I said, Lord Jesus, by your authority and power, I transmit the gift of faith to these people. And there was a roar of response that came back from that section. I went to the second section, did exactly the same thing. There was a roar of response that came back from that section. And I, they didn't hear my voice. They didn't know what I was doing. I, they couldn't even see me. I'm lost in the crowd. I went to the third section, a roar of response. The fourth section, a roar of response. When I got home, I called. For the t I knew something had happened. I knew I had a hold of something. I knew there was something different about me, but I wasn't sure what it was. I covered the T.W. Barnes. I explained the whole thing to him, and he just listened. When I finished telling what I just told you with a few more details, he said, boy, that's resurrection power. You didn't have that before you were raised from the dead. That's why these crowds come to hear you preach. They want to feel that. They want to touch that. They want to get involved with that. So it was last year, toward the end of the year, that God told me, Jesus told me, I want you to transmit this resurrection power to the people. And he said, I want you to do it at Landmark, at the last, the last night of the Landmark Convention. So I said, I'll do it. So I went to Landmark. There were 6,000 people there. I have preached the last night of that meeting for 25 or 30 years. I've lost track. But um, I went with the sole purpose of imparting the resurrection power that's in my life. And I preached something probably similar to this about believers, the power of believers. And then I said to them, I'm going to transmit to you this resurrection power. And I did it. People, it was like Niagara Falls. There was a roar they went up from this, those 6,000 people. People got the Holy Ghost. Backsliders prayed through. All kinds of things happened. But what was amazing about it 
when I got back to my hotel room that night at five o'clock in the morning, Chris Green came in and called me from the desk. He said, Brother Stone King, when you imparted that resurrection power, he said, they got it. I said, what do you mean? He said, there were people that were in that impartation. He said, they walked into the lobby downstairs. The woman behind the desk had excruciating pain in both legs, had had it for a year. The doctors couldn't help her, and she was in pain. And these believers, you, they, they said, he said, they walked over to her and said, we're going to pray for you. They laid hands on that woman in the lobby of the hotel, prayed for her, heat filled both legs she was instantaneously healed right there in the lobby of the hotel he said but it's even more powerful the next day Josh Herring called me he's mightily used by God he called me, he said, Brother Stone King, I was watching when you imparted that resurrection power. He said, there was a light that went out of you. I could see it going from you. He said, they got it. I said, what do you mean? Because he would call two days after that. He said, there were three preachers in that audience that received, got a hold of that impartation. He said, Brother Stone King, in the last 48 hours, they have seen three people raised from the dead across the country in America. Do you have any idea what would happen if our preach got a hold of resurrection power and began to use this like never before? We could take our cities. We could take our cities. We could take our cities. If you're a believer here tonight and you've got the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you've already got resurrection power inside of you. Just raise your hands and worship the Lord because of it. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, such as I have, in the name of Jesus, I impart to you this resurrection power. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it. That's it. Let your voice out. That resurrection power is upon you. That resurrection power is upon you. Every man, every woman, every young person, it's upon you. Do you want to be mightily used by God? How many of you want to be mightily used by God? You ought to come running to this altar with the resurrection power that is upon you and throw your voice in the air and say, Lord Jesus, by the grace of God, by the authority of God, I'm going to use this power. In the name of Jesus, Lord Jesus, tonight upon every preacher on this platform, I, I impart this resurrection power, this authority, this power, this authority, receive it. In fact, you preachers ought to get a hold of each other and just rejoice in what I'm talking about because it's in this house. It's upon you. It's upon us as a people. It's upon us as a people. That's it. Just let your voice out. Let your voice out. Hot talker with whatever energy you've got left. Just let your voice out and shout to the Lord. Rejoice in him.